Everybody, thanks for joining us for another weekly e-learning session here with Peerless. Uh, today we have Allied Circuits, uh, and you see I'm Kevin Renaud, you got Dan Morgan, Greg Barrell, Chris Shinta, Dave McKendry, and Carl Phillips here. So we are going to go dark and get going here. So thanks for joining us. So once again, we do have Allied Circuits here with us today, and the topic is electrical wiring diagrams and schematic symbols. I'm going to tell you right up front after the dry run. There is a lot of tremendous information here. We may go a little bit longer than we normally do, but um, if you have to bail on us, it will be recorded and it'll be available on our website. So um, let's get started. So once again, we have a tremendous group here joining us this morning. Thank you again for taking time out of your day. Um, from all around the world, you see even China, and of course not drawn to scale. Um, so 1914 Peerless opened, um, downtown Buffalo primarily is a mill supply, general mill supply company selling uh, out of a catalog. Uh, over the years, we have evolved significantly because we, quite honestly, we had to. Um, we're now ISO certified and a trusted source for process components. So we operate under three distinct groups. Our process team is, uh, they work in the plant environment and more of the MRO type uh, systems, chemical, pharmaceutical, food, beverage, et cetera. And the Procore team, this is a group that was carved out about nine years ago to focus specifically on the unique requirements of equipment builders and OEMs, um, featuring like global concerns of area requirements and high spec projects. Our high temp fabrication group, uh, we deal with scientific surfaces, laboratory casework, and we do machine uh, high temp insulation and surfaces to print. So allow me to offer a 20 second sales pitch here um, because we never really have done this. So we have three distinct groups of people out here joining us. We have existing customers, we have good prospects, and we have people that are saying, you know, who the heck is Peerless and why did my boss ask me to be here today? So to our existing customers, we just simply say thank you for, for being a part of what we're doing. Um, thanks for supporting us. Thanks for uh, trusting us. Um, and to our good prospects, speaking of trust, we hope that we can build trust uh, working through the process with you and, and turn you from a good prospect, hopefully into a, a future customer. Finally. For the third group where you know you don't know much about us, we would just hope that something through this process will, will, will be retained for future information and you might have a need and you might think of us. So uh, please do that. There's a, you can contact us in, in these avenues and we look forward from hearing you down the road, from you down the road. So with that, I'm gonna get to the present uh, introductions. From Peerless, we have Dan Morgan. Uh, he's our continuous improvement manager. He also heads our engineering team. Uh, speaking of our engineering team, Diane Passanant is one of our application engineers. She does spend a great deal of her time working with the electrical requirements and is oftentimes working on ISA data sheets for, with our customers. Uh, Greg Barrell heads up our process group uh, in the plant environment. Uh, Dave McKendry is our, the captain of the ship here. And there's me, Kevin Renaud. I spend most of my time with equipment builders um, and uh, OEMs. So now the allied side of things. Chris Shinta, uh, the partner, COO. Uh, there's also Chris Aquiline, um, the his business partner. Carl Phillips, engineering manager, and Mark Roswell, one of their project managers. So just a little bit about Chris and Chris. Um, like Fred and Barney, these guys have been friends forever. Um, in fact, this is a picture of them when they're age 13, uh, fishing. No doubt taking a break uh, from a spirited conversation over who's cooler, George Ohm or Gustav Kirchhoff. Um, no doubt about that. So um, on a more serious note, though, um, they, they are very heavily involved in what we know is the 11-day power play here in Buffalo. Um, it's literally an 11-day power play. They devote a bunch of time, effort, and quite uh, honestly money in a sponsorship, uh, sponsorship form uh, for uh, this cause that goes to some great local charities. So thanks, Chris and Chris, for what you guys do there every year. So uh, to date, they've raised over $5 million, this organization, um, for these causes. So thanks for that. So next, Dan Morgan, I'm going to turn it back to you so you can uh, kind of introduce the platform for today's meeting. Yes, awesome. Thanks, Kev. Um, good introduction. Uh, we'll get to Chris in just a moment. I'm going to take control quickly here for a second and just uh, for anyone that's maybe new uh, joining us for the first time here today, um, I'm just going to introduce what you're looking at in front of you in terms of the control panel within the webinar platform um, and talk about it a little bit. So a um, few uh, options you might want to uh, check out here. So um, if this control panel is in the way of any of the view of the presentation, you can click this orange button to collapse it down. Um, toggling in and out of full screen mode can be done with this button. 
Um, if you're having any challenges or trouble with anything, um, you can use this raise hand feature. I'll be able to see that. Um, and then I can chat with you and, and try to work through anything you need. Um, changing audio functions, uh, your, your, in, your inputs and uh, your feedback uh, could uh, be done right here. And then most importantly, uh, an area we want you to pay attention to and get familiar with is this questions and chat area. So um, as Chris is going through his presentation, um, if there's anything at all that you have a question on or want some more feedback on or something that's uh, specific to an application that you have in mind that you maybe want to discuss a little bit deeper, um, please feel free to submit your question, type it out and hit send right in this panel. Um, what I'll be doing is keeping an eye on that area. Um, I'll be monitoring those questions that come in and I'll be finding opportunities uh, within Chris's presentation to fit those questions in um, so that we can have a good discussion and get you the answers that you need. So. Um, yeah, please don't hesitate. You know, we want all the participa participation that, uh, that we can get. So, um, all right, I think that's enough of us. Um, so I'm gonna hand this back over to Chris now. You can take it away. Got it, Chris? Want to check his mute, Dan? Yeah, I'm not getting any audio, Chris. Can you check your uh, mute button, possibly? How about now? Yeah, perfect. Oh, sorry. Nah, no worries. Good enough. <laughs> Thank you, everyone, for joining us. I was saying, I clearly, I got to step up my game on my uh, my mug shot to keep up with the good-looking peerless gang there. <laughs> but um, in any case. I, and I appreciate the uh, the shot from us as children. Yes, it's true. The two of us uh, have been friends all the way from uh, third grade. And uh, we ended up buying this company back in 2008, Allied Circuits. Uh, we're located in Buffalo, New York. Uh, we started off as, it was a panel builder that was um, started in 1987. And we purchased, it was a customer of ours in 2008. And from there, we had 15 employees. We um, grew that up to about 60 employees and, and tripled size. Uh, really thanks to loyal customers, some that are on this call. Um, so we've been able to expand not just our, our markets, but the services we do. So in, from building panels, we ended up doing schematics, drawing sets, uh, programming and integration and field service and got uh, deeper into uh, hazardous locations and stuff like that. So uh, for all those reasons, uh, really our customers were the ones that were bringing that uh, us into those different areas. And um, uh, that investment is uh, re really contributed to our growth. But uh, we were talking, Peerless and, and Allied Circuits, are, uh, we work closely together. And uh, so we like to do uh, these webinars. And um, the one that uh, we discussed is a lot of our customers really don't understand electrical schematics, mostly because they come from mechanical backgrounds or they might have business type backgrounds, but they don't have the the electrical background. And that's why I thought this might be a good starting point. This is really meant to be an intro on this and, and really to talk about automation. And this is an easy thing to, um, you see it every single day and everything that we use, what we, what we consume, uh, even the cars we drive. Everything you see has automation. There's no secret there. And uh, if you look what's going on in today's world, right? What's the big news is um, the vaccines out. And the only way you're gonna mass produce that vaccine uh, is with automation. So how do we design an automation system? Well, we have an electrical schematic diagram and uh, that that's what we use to show all of the where all the wires are going and what's going on within the control and understand how the circuit works itself. It's something we use to help troubleshoot and to build. But the automation design itself first has to be based on what the mechanical information is. So typically we'll start with a piping and instrument uh, instrumentation diagram. Uh, or machine drawings or something that tells us we, we need to know what it is that we need to control. So how do we use this? Well, we make this electrical um, uh, controls schematic and we have all these different drawings. How do we take that though to make this? And that's really what we're focused on today. 
the first thing we tell everybody when there is a drawing set is one, look at the title block, make sure that you have the correct drawing number and just as importantly, the correct revision. And if you look at this, you can see that um, we had the original, there were then, um, put my pointer on here. There we go. Uh, you can see that there were revisions that were made. The as built, we added the ethernet network and um, we made some revisions after the fact. And all of these are dated. And um, that's the purpose basically of the title block is to make sure you have the correct drawing set and rev. From there, you'll see the um, table of contents. And um, this just tells you what you're looking for and where it is in the drawing set. Also, you'll see that in the reference diagrams. But the notes piece over here is something you really want to pay attention to because it's basically telling you it's, it's almost like the ingredients of what we're using to make the, the drawing set. So it tells you everything you need to know. In this case, you'll see that it's following you out 508. It gives you information on the conductors, the enclosure, the NEMA ratings. Um, et cetera. So it's going to give you all that data that you need to know on the front side. Um, secondly, you're going to see its symbols and wiring because you want to be under, you want to be able to understand what these symbols are representing. So we'll always include electrical symbols and wiring information. So if you look at that, here's the example of the symbols themselves and next to it, you'll see the descriptions. We also add the wiring information. So this again is a table that will tell you all you need to know about the wiring information itself, the type of wire that's gonna be used, the colors, stuff like that. So I wanna go over a couple um, symbols now, just so that we, um, we might be able to use these later on in the presentation. So push button, you see these things every single day. It's a mechanical device that's basically used to turn on or off a circuit. Um, quite often you'll see it as a, as a momentary device where it's just going to start something and then it's going to have a spring release. You see them every single day. Uh, that's what one would look like in the industrial world. You'll see it as a start-stop circuit. And for the newer cars, you, you use it every day to start your car. Selector switch is very similar to that. It's going to be a rotary device in this case. And these can get more complicated, but a selector switch is just a mechanical device that's also going to turn on or off a circuit. And examples of this you'll see is a handoff auto type selector switch. That's where you're going to have a motor in an off position. You can put it in auto or you can put it into the hand or manual mode. Uh, they can also be illuminated. And again, if you have a, a car that doesn't have the push button start, it's a selector switch that you're using every day to start your car. A transformer is something that we use to transform the voltage itself. And the reason we need to do that is a lot of times we're just having a three phase uh, input going or three phase power going into our panel. From there, we have to transform that into a safer voltage that we're going to use for control um, or for other devices. And here's some examples of what transformers might look like. And if you look at this diagram here on the right, you'll see that this transformer can take 460 or 230 and it will transform it into 115 volts. And this diagram comes right off of a transformer. You see it on all of them. So first, let's understand just a little bit about short circuit. Um, short circuiting is it's when you have an electric flow that takes the wrong intended path. And what happens is it has very little or no electrical resistance. It can cause damage, fire, and even small scale explosions. If you take a look, especially at this middle one here with this guy, I'm sure he was not expecting this. But what is good news is it looks like he had pretty good PPP on, so he, he should have survived that. Uh, one thing I will always say, by the way, and many of you will know this, if you're ever gonna turn on an electrical panel, don't ever do it from right in front of the panel. You always step to the side and then you would hit the lever up. So what causes a short circuit? Well, there's a number of factors on this. Um, one is, is water damage. That's why NEMA ratings, stuff like that, if it's gonna be in a damp environment, maybe outside, you gotta make sure your NEMA rating, which is what uh, keeps the, um, the ingress or making sure that water won't get into it. Water damage to obviously to an electrical circuit is just bad news. Um, sometimes you get cables that might get pinched or damaged or something like that. That also can cause a short circuit, a loose connection. So if there's a loose termination of some type and that wire gets out, it can cause a short circuit. And then of course, there's always issues and people may not know this, but sometimes animals or something like that can get into those outdoor type panels and they'll chew through them. And next thing you know, you got a short circuit. So we have to safeguard against all of those things. So how do we do that? Um, 
first there's fuses um and you see fuses i'm sure this is nothing new to anybody fuses are there just to break the circuit themselves and they can do it in a very quick manner uh, the advantages are that they're very simple to use they trip very quickly they're not very expensive and they don't require any maintenance the downside to fuses is um you have to replace a blown fuse so sometimes people have they have to go find that exact same fuse if you're in a factory and i i remember this from years ago having to find that fuse and get the exact right one if it's not in the panel could take time the other part is that if you have a three-phase application you blew one fuse the other two phases could still be live um circuit breakers have some advantages and disadvantages as well um, on the advantages, um, it, you, it, you can reset it after a trip. So once it faults, you have to correct the fault, and then you can reset it. No looking for a fuse in this case. It will trip all three phases at the same time. Um, it's easy to use with an on-off switch as well for maintenance, and um, a circuit breaker can also add ground fault protection. A disadvantage, though, is that um, it's more expensive. You do require maintenance on this over time, and it is a, is a slower trip than fuses. So let's look at our diagram here. At the very beginning, we so we have a, a panel, right? And what's going to happen is our our customer or whatever this application is going to be is going to have to connect power to it, which is what you see up here. That's the starting point. So what is almost on every single panel will be a main disconnect. And let's blow that up. And what you see here is the main disconnect. In this case, it's a circuit breaker type disconnect. It's got a ground lug, and then what will be in the drawing is it'll tell the cust it'll tell the uh, the installer exactly what type of power. In this case, 575 volts, three phase, 60 hertz, and the full load amps of this panel is 210 amps. So let's talk about the main disconnects themselves just quickly. There's these would be three examples of rotary type through the door disconnects. There's a non-fusible, so there is no protection on this other than having as basically an on-off for the panel. Uh, there's fusible disconnect, so you can see it's a rotary disconnect here with the fuses. You can see some LBJ fuses that are in there right now, which will handle your short circuit protection. And then there's a circuit breaker type disconnect as well. Again, that's going to handle your short circuit protection. But I want to make sure that you understand, as I was showing those other pictures, there's flange disconnects. And these a little bit more expensive, a little bit more difficult to install at times. But what it does allow you is that it'll give you the circuit. Um, the disconnect handle will be off to the side and this allows you to make sure you don't stand in front of a panel uh, as you're turning it on so in this what you'll see here is a, a fixed or a variable depth type disconnect here's one that uh, we like to use a lot which is the cable operated disconnect which is a little bit easier to install and you can see how you can use that cable operated disconnect with a circuit breaker or you could do it with a fuse as well a fusible uh, disconnect as well so from there we have our disconnect we now have power we need to distribute that power and what we do with that is a power distribution block and that allows us to move the power uh, into different locations if i blow that up again you see there's the disconnect there's the power distribution block right here and there's different types of, of power distribution typically this is what you'll see in power distribution almost all the time is some type of block you got a single phase coming i'm sorry single conductor coming in and then multiple conductors coming out. Uh, what we are seeing more often now is because you typically need fusing with the power distribution block for your protection to really get the short circuit current ratings. So what they're, they're doing now is they're putting fuses within the power distribution block as well. And another example to distribute power is bus bar. And I'll blow this up. If you take a look here, here's the main disconnect, which is feeding this horizontal bus. So all of these devices, all of these uh, breakers and motor starters are able to connect right to that bus. And it's a way when you have a lot of power and a lot of amps to, um, it's, it's a little bit more convenient to do it with a bus bar power distribution. So if we look at our actual build, there's the main disconnect, power distribution block, there's the information. Same thing here, ground lug. There's our ground lug right there. There's the circuit breaker disconnect. You see the cable that goes to the handle here, and there's our power distribution. This is the actual build uh, from that um, drawing set that, or that schematic that you just saw.
So what we do with that power and that bus is that we are then going to be feeding motors. So this is uh, this is blown up is because this is a motor starter itself. What you see is we have our short circuit protection as we just discussed, but then we have these other parts of a contactor and overload that are required to start a motor. And a motor starter is a contactor plus the motor, uh, the overload. That's what makes up the motor starter itself. So to introduce you to really what motor control is, if you think about the invention of a three phase AC motor, when that was invented, we had to find a way to start this. So what they did way back in time was they would use these knife switches, but they were very unsafe as you can tell. Um, and you had to worry about some type of, um, of arcing as you were starting it. And you had to have an operator nearby to activate the switch. And these are the type of switches you would see in any type of Frankenstein movie, whatever else you turn them on, the sparks, et cetera. We had to have a different way back in time. And this is what we need to make that happen. First, you need to have your short circuit protection like we just discussed. So you're gonna have your fuses or you're gonna have protection with your breaker on the front side but you also need overload protection so you'll see here here's the example of the overloads and an overload relay the overload protection is, is protecting against overheating for that protected equipment now the contactor itself is um when i first got into controls and first did engineering somebody took a contactor and took it apart and explain to me how it worked. So I thought this was important to show to those that are, are newer to um, uh, automation. So if you look here, we have a coil. This is what we're activating here. We're sending a signal here to make this coil is gonna energize, which is gonna collect, a, it's gonna make an electromagnetic field, which is then gonna pull in this armature and in a result is going to now allow three phase power to turn on a three phase motor. And I have some, um, videos of this hey chris yes sorry to interrupt before you dive into this video can you go back a few slides i'll let you know uh it's when you first showed the video or the the image uh slide number 21 21 yes yeah so okay so we had a question come in on this um yeah. from a chemical engineer so is that kind of what we're talking about here the question is um why are the three wires so 102 103 104 um you mentioned uh different colors for those wires. Can you can you just explain like the, the reason for that? Yeah, it's actually not 102, 103, 104. That is actually, I, in fact, I didn't discuss this. That's from the clip I made. That's okay. actually the numbering on the drawing itself. It's, it's Those are actually reference points on the drawing. Okay. So I would tell you that uh, the main disconnect is on the, la for the ladder diagram in the schematic is at 102. Okay. okay. And, and um, so it's, helps you, it's a way to help locate things. Okay, and Those they're different colors. Um, yeah. Can you explain the reasoning for the different, in, yeah, the difference in colors yep, as well? Yep. It's just to make sure that you have the, the, just to keep the phases themselves in line. So each color yeah. there is going to represent a different phase. So it's a three-phase system. Okay, perfect. Okay. I'll, and, you'll uh, see below, yep. and below you see the exact same thing, so you know that that's the first phase, second phase, third phase. Oh, sorry, my perfect. pointer's not on. Okay, Chris, um, if, I, if I could just step in there with the brown, yeah. with the brown, orange, yellow, that is uh, by uh, NEC code that, that's referencing that it's 480 volt uh, power going through those wires. So whenever you see brown, orange, yellow, that's, that's what it would be referencing. And it's always easy to remember that by the boy. That's how I always remember it. The first phase is B, O, and Y. So for brown, orange, yellow. Perfect. I'll uh, yeah, I'll uh, follow up with this uh, attendee and see if there's any follow up to that. But but thanks for the explanation. Okay. okay. So let's take a look at this diagram. What they're gonna show in this video is they're again, they're gonna energize this coil with a low voltage single phase signal here. Could be a 20 volt, in this case, it's uh, an AC power. It's gonna be probably 120 volt or 24 volt signal. And it's gonna energize this coil. What it's gonna do is move the armature here, which again is going to start this motor. If you take a look, you have a normally closed contact here. If we had a light attached to this right now before, 
the uh, armature engages, this light would be on. And if we had a light on this, normally open contact, this light would be off. So if we watch the video, you'll see the armature pull in and the motor turn on. I'll show you another video, very similar. So again, here's the coil. They're going to energize this coil. You'll see there's power right now at L1, L2, L3. And uh, when the coil engages, the armature is going to pull in and give power to T1, T2, T3. Now, that's all cool, but what I really wanted to do was make a video to show uh, basically what I saw when I was first getting in engineering. And thanks to YouTube, there's one out there. So instead of reinventing the wheel, I'm gonna borrow this. Take a look at what's going on here. What he did was he connected a push button with a 24 volt uh, DC um, uh, um, control. Uh, circuit into the coil of the contactor. Let's watch the video. You're going to see the armature pull in. You'll also see, just take note of what's going on um, on the side of the um, contactor as well. He's going to take off the protective device. Now we can really get a good angle of what, or a good um, view of what the armature is doing here. He's going to show a different angle. And you'll see what happens is, is the armature is pulling in when he disengages, the spring is pushing the armature back out. So another piece here that I wanted to show though, is that he's gonna add on a auxiliary contact off to that side um, part of the armature. And this is gonna be a normally open. What he's gonna do from there is he's gonna add a light. And this is going to, um, show you that when he, he he engages the contactor, the light's gonna turn on. And that's how you use an aux contact that's with the contactor itself. So if there's any questions on that, please let Dan know. Actually, Chris, there's a real quick follow-up on mm -hmm. our, our previous question that came in about uh, the, the color scheme of those three wires. Um, so the brown, orange, yellow, the boy uh, that we talked about, um, is that only for a three-phase system or is it any time you have a 480 volt system or or both, I guess. I'm, I'm sorry, say it again. So the, the brown, orange, yellow color scheme, is that only, does that only exist for a three phase system? Um, or I believe Carl mentioned that uh, it's signified also as a 400, 480 volt um, system. So is it only in a three phase or is it any time you have 480 volts? Does that, does that question make sense? Yeah. I, Carl, you can step in here too, but um, on the power on power itself, it also depends on what code you're following. So what he was mentioning there was for the NEC code. If it's okay. uh, say it's 120 volt, you're going to be using, well, actually in in the power end of that, you're going to be using black, and then red wire would also um, signify 120 volts or AC low voltage. Um, in DC, you're going to see um, blue which is going to be signifying. So, so different colors have different meanings. But if you remember on the first page of the, of the schematic, we explain all of the wiring colors and what they're representing. Yes, okay, good call. Okay, perfect. Um, and then just a reminder here to go back into full screen mode. Yeah. It, uh, reduced, yep, perfect. There we go. Yep. Okay, so let's take a look at a very simple circuit here. So we went over what a push button looks like. This is the coil, in this case, for this for this relay. Before we push this button, you'll see this green light would be on because it's going through a normally closed contact. The red button or the red light would be off because it's got an open contact. But if we push the button down, you'll see we'll engage the contact relay. The green light would go off and the red light would go on.
again, let's look at a simple start, uh, start stop type circuit. You'll see right now the relay is not going to be engaged because the contact is open and the start button is not. So we have no con continuity to uh, turn on the coil. However, if you hit the start button here, you are now going to have a circuit, and this is called a ceiling circuit, where the contact from CR1 is going to close. So once the start button is uh, returned, it's still going to stay engaged because you now have continuity going through. So let's take a look at a motor starter circuit. So again, we have, there is our, um, our disconnect, there's our short circuit protection, and we have the motor contact here with the overload and there's the motor. Here's the transformer that we discussed. So say this is 480 coming in and we'll call it 120 volt on the secondary. There's nothing that's turned that motor on until we hit the motor start push button. We push that down, the motor is gonna now turn on and you'll see that the contact for M1 is going to keep the motor running. The only way that that's gonna break is uh, three different ways. One, we hit the stop button. Two, the fuse blows. Or three, if you see the overload relay here, if something happens with the overload, it is also gonna disconnect the circuit, which will also turn off the motor. So another example, say a simple pressure alarm in this case. Um, you're gonna have the, uh, the, the relay it's gonna have a normally closed circuit. So this is gonna have that lamp on at all times. When it hits pressure, it's gonna engage the relay, which is gonna break that circuit in this case. And a thermostat circuit, and these are things we see every day in our houses. Again, we're gonna have a start button. It's gonna seal in that contact. That's gonna allow this motor to run, green light's gonna be on. When the thermostat, however, reaches temperature, it's going to turn on CR2. This normally closed circuit is now going to open, which is going to disengage the motor. So step three on this whole on um, doing something that would be a build based on the schematics is we're going to identify and assemble all those components. And in this case, we talked about starters, we talked about the main disconnect. You'll see that in this drawing set, we have variable frequency drives. And similar to motor starters, a variable frequency drive is a way to turn on a motor and, and run a motor. But the difference is that a motor starter is one speed, it's on or it's off. A variable frequency drive allows you to uh, control the speed and the torque. It also gives energy savings. Um, it, it gives you intelligent motor control and um, there's reduction of peak that's drawn. So it's great reasons to use the VFD and really just to be able to have that type of control and the energy savings makes it well worth it. And more than, I'd say probably more often we use VFDs than starters in most of our applications at this point. Uh, some common applications you'll see are fans, pumps, uh, compressors, and uh, conveyors. And you can think of a conveyor, right? Say it's a bunch of bottles on a conveyor. If you start that abruptly, the bottles may all fall over or stop it abruptly, the bottles may fall over. So you may use a VFD as a way to ramp up the conveyor and ramp it down. So we've talked about the transformer. We're gonna move on to what the 120 volt section would be. And we use 120, vo 120 volts for things like we're gonna power up receptacles or we're gonna power up different types of, um, uh, of AC units, air conditioning units here that would be used to keep, say, the panel cold. But we also have 24 volt control. And to get 24 volt DC control, we would use a power supply. And that's what was being used in that video that you saw um, where the guy was pressing the button and the light was turning on. So here's some examples of different types of 24 volt DC control. It's having a 120 volt input or a 460 volt input, 208 volt input. And it's similar to a transformer. It's now bringing it to 24 volts, but in this case, DC. Chris, and quick, quick question that. that just came yep. in. Sorry. Um, yep. Good. So can a VFD take a single phase 120 VAC and convert to three phase? Does that make sense? No. No, it's, it's going to take a single phase and convert it to three phase? Yeah. Yeah. There's not a way that um, I know of doing that. Carl? 
I'm, I'm sorry, I missed the very first part of that. Did you say a transformer changing it into three phase? No, he's talking about they're talking about any way of a single phase going to a three phase. Uh, the only way you can do that is through a VFD. They do have some okay. of those where you can do a single phase 230 volt, and then uh, the, the VFD would simulate a three phase signal out to the, the motor or whatever it's controlling. Okay, that, that, yes, that was the question is whether or not a VFD can do that. Yeah, uh, yeah, VFD can do that, yes. Okay. Awesome. Yeah, and then typically they're limited on size, though. I think, uh, I want to say if I was to guess at it, I think 15 horsepower, I think, is the max limit. Uh, it could go up a little higher, but, there, you know, you don't have a full array of sizes with uh, doing that. It's not like you can do it with 100 horsepower motor or anything like that but yes it is possible perfect okay um and then just sorry one, and one more quick question hopefully quick um on the topic of vfds um uh, one of the attendees wrote in i've seen panels include contactors after a vfd and panels with just a vfd which is the correct practice if there is one that's considered correct versus the other and we can follow up for more info if you need yeah, it. Yeah, we do both. Carl, do you want to take that one too? Um, so the question was with contactors after the VFDs? Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, that, uh, it, I, that has been done. I guess it could be a, a say, I, I've seen it. I don't know, uh, you know, you could use it to control the shut, to kill the power to the motor. Uh, more quickly than uh, if the drive's shutting down, because uh, they kind of ramp down the the, the VFDs. Um, so that could be more of a safety feature to uh, if it's a an application where that you want to kill the power right away. Right. You can, yeah, you can uh, do that that quickly by opening the contactor. Uh, it, it can be done, it, there, but uh, typically it's just a VFD out to the motor. Right. And Dan, if you take the uh, the question, we can dive into that offline deeper and yeah. get some more info yep. on that. Okay, makes sense. Thanks, guys. Okay. Um, so we use that control voltage, um, not only for the content and relay coils, but we have what we use our programmable logic controllers, the PLCs. And if anybody's been near a control panel, quite often you're going to see a PLC of some type that's in there. Um, to introduce you that to you quickly, basically you have a bunch of different inputs, similar to like push buttons, selector switches, and others that we'll get into, and um, limit switches, sensors. Um, you're going to take that information and you're going to process it. So you write a program that is going to do what you want with these inputs that's to then execute different outputs. And those outputs could be lights, horns, solenoids, motor signals, uh, different types of outputs. An example of this is when, like, when you're driving your car. I like to use this, this example because you have different input invoiced, uh, devices, which would be your eyes, your ears, your body is sensing how the road is. Like today I came in, it was you know, snowing out, you can sense the whole car is a little bit slippery today. Um, so information that you get is, am I in the lane? Where are the other cars? Do I hear a siren? Stuff like that. Is the road bumpy? Your output devices are your hands. Your hands are controlling the wheel. Your feet are controlling the pedals. Your head's moving so that your eyes can see. And um, you're going to steer the wheel. You're going to press on the brake, turn a directional, or, or you hear an ambulance, you're going to pull over. In this case, your your brain obviously is the PLC. So going back to that drawing, uh, we have inputs for the PLC, and you'll see different type of uh, there's an emergency stop here, um, a push button. There's different types of inputs that we're using that'll go into the input card to tell the PLC what's going on, and then we have outputs wired as well. So you'll see different relay coils that are coming from the output. The PLC is then going to turn on. In this case, it's going to be a horn of some type. So to give you more examples on the inputs, um, there's proximity switches, and these are used to basically tell you that there's something that's present or nearby and helps you understand the location of something that's going on within your machine. 
And uh, if you could think of um, what you see even in these faucets, there's like a photo eye in there that gives the proximity. It tells you there's someone there and it'll turn on. That's what, that's what uh, proximity sensors and photo eyes are doing. A limit switch is a little bit more of a simple device. And the purpose of it's electrical mechanical device. So say there's something that comes in position. Um, say a car door, for example, when the car door uh, opens, that there's be a limit switch there. It's going to tell that the door is open and the lights may turn on in the car. That'd be an example of a limit switch. And then there's a, a pressure switch. And a pressure switch, similar to other devices, it's just it's it's just measuring the pressure, making sure that pressure is uh, within the safe um, uh, within the safe pressure that was programmed or set for. And similar to a level switch, if anybody's ever had to work on your um, uh, on any type of uh, of a tank or something like that, you'll see level switches that are in there, uh, like a flow switch. Or even if you've ever repaired the, your your toilet, you'll see that there's a float switch. That's a form of a of a level switch. Uh, but we have output examples as well. So we talked about a horn earlier. This is a something that's going to make loud noise just to make sure you understand there's something wrong, there's a danger, or there's a fault. Same with lights. Lights are going to be some way of turning on or off or to, to indicate something to you that um, somewhere in the process, what's going on, is the motor started, for example, um, what state is it in? You'll see stack lights, um, different signaling, other type of beacons. Uh, solenoids is another example. So solenoids, uh, it, what it's really doing is a solenoid is going to be used on something like, say, uh, a solenoid valve. And what you do with that is it's a way of turning on like a, a pump, I'm sorry, a, um, a valve or uh, rather pneumatic in this case. But the operator interface is something that uh, can change all of this for you. So you have all these different inputs and all these different outputs. You can then take everything that has different meters, different types of selector switches and buttons and signaling devices and use all that within an operator interface. And what the, the operator interface is doing you is it, one, it's giving you a lot of flexibility, but it's also um, allowing you to do more without having to do all of this extra wiring, which costs typically more money when you have that many devices. So if you go back to um, an example of a, of a two pump circuit, you're gonna see that there's a main disconnect, power distribution block. You see we have frequency, uh, variable frequency drives. There's the power supply. And there's the operator interface in this case. Again, what you see here is some kind of three phase going in. And then it's getting distributed. There's the power supply there, which is giving this to 24 volts, and that is what we're using for our control voltage. And you also see a pilot light as well. On the outputs, this is you'll see the, the control for the PLC. You'll see the outputs are over here. Here's some of the outputs with different types of lights. We have inputs, discrete inputs in this case. And there's also analog inputs, and those are inputs that um, are not an on-off. It might be giving you something like, say, a temperature or a pressure. All the information would go to the PLC, and, and it'll be run within the code. This is an example of what that would look like when we build the panel. You got your main disconnect. There's your power distribution block. There's your ground bar. Fusible disconnect to disconnect the motors. There's one up here as well. Different type of circuit breakers for short circuit protection, a power supply to convert it to 24 volt DC. There's our PLC. And on the bottom, what you see here are the terminal blocks. And terminal blocks, that's a way for, um, the panel will all go to terminal blocks, but it's a way for the installer or the, or the user, when they install this panel, they know where to send all of their field wires and power wires into the panel, they're all labeled. And uh, it's very simple way for the, uh, the electrician to do the wiring. And this will be shown on pretty much every uh, schematic that we have. And this is what it would look like from the outside of the panel. There's the main disconnect, there's the fusible disconnects, 
There's the operator interface, and then we have a couple of different uh, push buttons here. And there's a side view. Uh, finally, the last thing you'll typically see on a drawing set is the bill of material. And this is basically telling you, this is all the ingredients that we use to, to make this, uh, this control panel. And it'll tell you all those parts. So if something ever fails, or if you need to get a replacement, it's gonna tell you what it is, where it is, and it's gonna tell you um, uh, what it's, uh, it's defined as, what its function is within the drawing set. So is there any questions? Um, let's see. Yeah. Uh, there's actually, <laughs> I, I have a question personally. So when you, uh, for you, when you see a schematic, do you actually visualize what that ends up looking like physically in the real world? Do you have that skill? <laughs> you know, it's funny. We have customers that will, um, they will start with us literally by drawing something on a sheet of paper. Um, so it, it'll get to that level. So yeah, the first thing we need to do though, is we need to understand what's going on mechanically so that we can start to visualize this, the schematic. And when you start to see the schematic, you have to pay attention because, uh, what might look like a small VFD might be pulling in, you know, 200 amps. So you have to really watch, um, what all those devices represent, but Doing this for 30 something years, yeah, after a while you start to get an idea of what that panel layout's gonna be. But what's nice is that we do everything in a AutoCAD electrical and there's, that's what we used to do, um, do the drawing sets. What's nice with that is that as we populate the, the material and do the schematic, the panel layout will populate as well. And that makes it very quick for us uh, because of our library, we can very quickly see uh, what that layout's gonna look like. And then you start to think about where you wanna position everything. So in the example I showed you, the terminal blocks, for example, those were at the bottom of the panel. And there was a reason for that because that's where the wires were gonna come in. That was the easiest location. Cool, so that's actually a good segue because we just had another question come in about AutoCAD um, where you mentioned, you mentioned AutoCAD electrical. So the question came in, is there a recommended set of symbols that uh, one would, would use with AutoCAD? Okay, that one's going to my AutoCAD expert. Go ahead, Carl. Why, why thanks, Chris. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, the AutoCAD electrical is going to come with uh, out-of-the-box symbols, um, and those would be you would have your, your NEMA symbols, and then you also, AutoCAD electrical has the option to pick uh, IEC symbols which would be the international type. Uh, they're a little different, you know, kind of the same idea behind them, but uh, it would be the NEMA style for North America. And if you use those ones, it's that comes out of the box. That's typically what we use. Now we can create symbols, uh, you're, you know, if, if you want a custom one, but uh, what they come, what comes out of the box is typically what, what's used. Okay, um, perfect. We'll see if there's any follow-up to that. Um, okay, one more question that just came in. So the VFD is shown at one voltage and the motor is shown at another voltage. There does not appear to be a connection between the VFD and motor except the transformer. How is the connection between VFD and motor denoted? Um, so that's probably a specific reference to one of your schematics here. Um, I'm not sure which one, but can you Maybe think back to where that might be referenced. Let's see. Um, if not, we can we can potentially do this one uh, offline. I'm trying to think of because there was two different places we had VFDs. I'm going to think it was probably up here. Sorry. It might be it might be that one there, Chris. I'm wondering if it's uh, the symbol right before the VFD, which is actually a line reactor. It's a it's a maybe that's what they're they're referring to. Okay. Yeah, well, you yeah, know what? I'm not sure. On yeah. Yeah. We'll we'll try to get some more information outside of here um, and follow up and maybe get a, a better. Uh, more efficient answer than okay. what we kind of come up with during this. Um, so I think that's all the questions we have for now. Um, I'm going to turn this back over to 
Kevin. Um, he's, I think, going to get us wrapped up. Yep. You got me? Yes. Actually, sorry, Kevin, before you start, one thing I want to mention, um, because it came up, uh, it was a question that came in earlier. So there is now, if you look in your control panel, there is now a handout available um, that is a copy of all the slides that you saw today. So um, if you go into the control panel, expand the hand, handouts uh, area, there's a PDF in there. You just click the link and it will download a copy of the PDF uh, of this presentation. So feel free to do that before, uh, before we leave today. Perfect. Thanks, Dan. Thanks, Chris. Um, I didn't think you could do it, uh, quite honestly. I think that's why I stepped up my pace even more than I usually speak for the introduction. So nice work getting through that. Um, I hope all agrees that it was a lot of information that's relevant and can help them down the road. Um, I would just want to point out one one thing on this this slide right here, this yellow panel. Um, Chris, I know you remember this um, quite oh, yeah. quite well. Um, this was a, a particular project that one of our customers came to us after their normal um, uh, control panel builders just either couldn't do it or didn't care to go through the specifications. Uh, these went to Abu Dhabi and it was as challenging uh, a pile of documents for specification that we've seen. Um, and, and Allied Circuits stepped up. It wasn't easy um, at all throughout the process, but they worked with a customer um, and they were delivered. I can't remember how many there were, six or seven of them maybe? Yeah. But um, yeah. It, the funny thing about that, Kevin, too, you know, if is when they did the, in, and the installation happened in Abu Dhabi, they didn't catch on the drawing set. They had, the, they had it uh, wired backwards. So um, it cost them a little bit of time and, um, and money to get that reset. So again, that's why it's so important to pay so much attention on the, um, on the drawing set itself and read those notes. Right. If I recall, do they have to switch around the, uh, the gland yes. panel down here? That's right. exactly what it was, yeah. That's, exactly, that's right. All right. Well, thanks again, everybody. Um, we do appreciate it. We do uh, have a certificate of completion if you wish to get one. Um, and as far as what the future holds, we are um, going to take a break with the holidays coming up. We do believe that many people are going to be taking some vacation that unfortunately they haven't had time to use uh, because of the situation going on here with the pandemic. So um, we would encourage you if you missed out, this was our 26th um, e-learning session of the year, which is, um, again, it's because we've had continuous attendance from your part uh, that we've kept doing it. So we do appreciate it. Uh, your comments are, are greatly appreciated. You will be seeing a survey at the conclusion. Um, and again, all the previous recordings, as this one will be, uh, can be found on our website for uh, download anytime you wish to view them. So thanks again. Um, stay safe. Happy holidays. We will talk to you soon. And again, if anything should come up, um, please feel free to, to reach out to us. We're anxious and ready. So thanks again. Take care.